Today, we're going to learn how to use an ESP32 to create an offline chat server on this episode of Cyber Weapons Lab. A project I really like is called the Pirate Box. And while it is really awesome, it also requires a Raspberry Pi in order to do all these awesome functions, such as offline chat in an area that might not have access to infrastructure. Now, where something like this might be useful is maybe after a disaster in an area that's super remote, or if you wanted to pop up a community billboard or something like that, where anybody could add messages, this is a really cool way of taking the functionality, or at least a piece of the functionality of the Pyro Box, and making it work on a five or less dollar device. Now, the ESP32 is really cool because it does have the processing power necessary to put up this chat server and also create a Wi-Fi access point so anybody can join on a computer or a phone. And what's really cool about it is, unlike some other sketches I've found that work on the ESP32 that host a Telnet chat server, this allows you to do it on a browser. So you can do this on your phone or any other device that has a web browser built into it. Now, in order to follow along, you'll just need a computer with Arduino IDE and an ESP32, and you can find these on Amazon or AliExpress, and you can check out the Nullbyte article linked in the description if you want to be able to find those links. If you also get confused, you can check out that link as well, because we have lots of troubleshooting steps. All right, in order to get started, let's get all these things together and then create our offline chat server. Okay, so today we're gonna to be working with this project on GitHub, which is by Fenwick67, that's called the ESP32 Chatterbox. Now this is built as a public anonymous bulletin board, and there's lots of different things we can do with it. And fortunately, the documentation is very nice. Uh, so although there is one release, which leads me to think that this person does software for a living uh, because uh, they actually made it easy for people to flash this. Uh, I flash it and it doesn't work because it's made for an Adafruit feather. And I'm using some crazy other ESP32 board. So I'm gonna show you guys how to get that started and how to actually install this. All right, so first we're going to click on clone or download. Then I'm going to go to a terminal window, which is probably full of stuff. Yep. I'm going to make it larger. And I'm going to ls, I can see, I actually already have this, I'll go up a folder and ls again. I'm going to, see I'm in the null byte folder, so I'll get clone and then the ESP32 chatterbox. And as you can see, it's already there, but I'm just gonna, for this purpose, remove it. rm, rf, ESP32 chatterbox. Okay, so that's gone. Right? Yes. All right, so we'll go ahead and clone this and I will CD into it. And inside we have a bunch of different stuff, but the most important things are the ESP32 chatterbox to INO and uh, the web uh, HTML page.h. So these things will all need to come together in order to get this running. So let's first open up the ESP32 chatterbox to INO and Arduino is going to say, hey, we need to put this in a folder um in order to continue and that's all great but guess what as soon as we try to compile this it's not going to be able to find the files it relies on um web server or sorry uh, html page dot h because that's the one that's custom for this and if we don't put it in there we're gonna have a problem so if i ls i can see this has now made a folder inside it called esp32 chatterbox and arduino ide did that itself for us very nice of it um, but we now need to move the html page over so I'm just gonna go, let's see if this works. Uh, MV HTML, I could do this manually, but why, why bother? Um, I'm gonna move that over to ESP32 Chatterbox. Let's see if that works. So CD ESP32 Chatterbox, LS, and okay, now we have the HTML page. Let's see if this works. Well, actually there's one last thing we need to do. All right, so we need to install the board before we can actually connect to it. So here, I'm gonna to refer to a guide, in this case, Random Nerd Tutorials, because they do great stuff. But I'm just gonna grab this URL that is the URL that leads back to all the packages from the ESP32. And we can go into Arduino IDE, go to Preferences, and you'll see this additional board manager URL. Just drop the, um, well, it's right here, because I already have it. But just drop the URL right here and then press OK. And what that will do is allow us to install these boards so that if you're just getting started with this, you can use Arduino IDE to play with these microcontrollers. So we're gonna to go to tools and then go to board manager. 
And from there, we're going to, when it actually opens, um, board manager, we're going to type in ESP32, and that should allow us to access uh, the ESP32 board to install. So it's downloading platforms, ESP32, and here we can see ESP32 by Expressive Systems. Just go ahead and click install. Okay, so now under the tools menu, we should have a bunch of ESP32 boards available for us to select. In my case, I'm using some random one that I just like the size of, and uh, I have a lot of reasons for that. Um, but basically, let's scroll down to the ESP32 section. Oh my god, is this it? Yes, it is. Wow. All right, so look at how many boards are available here. There are a lot of boards. And I'm using this one. So you'll need to select whichever board you're using. And then the rest of these settings should be mostly default. Here it's auto-selected my port, but you'll need to select whichever port uh, the ESP32 is connected to. And once that is all done, then we should be able to flash this over. So if you want to take a look at this code, um, you can change some of these variables and customize this. If you really wanted to make the HTML nicer, you could probably dress this up so it doesn't look so basic. But for now, it's just a very kind of plain Jane, simple way of doing this. And I will also change the access point to null net. And I guess that the rest of that looks fine. So, all right, we're going to go ahead, I'll enlarge this and then press upload. We're going to see a bunch of ESP32 stuff happen. And this one doesn't blink. It's a little creepy. The ESP8266 is blink when you, when you flash them, but these ones just continually flash or just are red. So I have no idea if this is actually flashing when it does start flashing, but it seems to work so all right so this is what we're gonna do we're gonna wait for this to finish flashing and there we go we can see that this red text means that it's starting to flash over and once it's done flashing we are going to access the web interface and we're also going to do some troubleshooting just in case we're not sure about what the ip address is okay so it is done um i'm gonna press command shift m to make sure there's no crazy errors i've got a bunch of question marks but hey that's great um i don't know what that means but it doesn't tell me that it, there's a brownout detected or something so and it's not crashing continually so you know good things so i'm gonna go ahead and connect to hopefully the network it's created it takes me a while to scan through them on this computer and if it does manage to find it then we're going to connect to that network and attempt to post something in our chat all right and i also just press the reset button and i got that wonderful brownout detector was triggered uh, alert, which if you flash the other uh, code that's just pre-compiled, then this can happen. Oh my god. Well, the scan is pathetic, but here we go. We now see Nullnet, and we're going to go ahead and connect to it. And if it's successful, we also should see a note from the microcontroller telling us that someone's connected, or at least giving us some sort of information about that, hopefully. The network null net could not be joined. Of course, it's because we're doing a demo. Let's try it again. And sometimes I find that the angle of this antenna is also sometimes important. Why? I have no idea. All right, I'm going to move this away a little bit and try that. All right, I've plugged this in again. See if I can still see null net. If not, I'll press the reset button once. Here's null net. Okay, so after a little bit, I was able to get it to connect. And it turns out one thing is if you're using, as I am a MacBook Pro, and you have a dongle, which is splitting power, it might not be able to supply enough power and you might get a brownout warning. So if you do, then you might uh, get really tired of this brownout detector was triggered warning, and you might just wanna move over to a different power cable or yeah, um, maybe just a, a, a USB interface that isn't splitting the power as much. Okay, so now that we have this, let's go ahead and go to Firefox. And I'm going to actually first use the terminal window to locate where uh, the IP address is on the network of the chat. So I'll type arp-scan-l and I can see 192.168.11. Okay, cool, not very surprising. Let's go ahead and try to go there. And hopefully we'll be able, there we go, to see Chatterbox, awesome. And we can see we've now done a get request. Hello, 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 post it. So the goal here is to be able to oops, post. Am I blocking? Mm, oh, no script. Disable. 
Mm, let's try refreshing. So as you can see, this is not a super sophisticated chat. It's definitely a little bit buggy and it's not the fastest, but if you're in an area where there's literally no other option, this definitely will do the trick if you need lightweight communication. Okay, there we go. We can see it's moving again. And now I can post. All right, so a little bit of a bug at first, but now we're able to post messages. Now, what's interesting here is uh, there's not a lot of um, restrictions on how much you can really paste. So if I wanted to just copy this whole thing or something that was much longer, I could just paste it in. Hopefully I could paste it in. See if I can paste it in. Oh, it's probably at the top. And there we go. Yeah, it's all there. Okay, so now let's try the final thing. Let's see if we can get another person to join and actually be able to send a message. Now this might also uh, cause us to crash. And one thing is if you want to delete the messages, then I can just go to the serial and type C. So there we go. Now it's been overwritten. And hopefully if I go back, yes, you can see that the chats have been deleted. So you can manage your kind of billboard here. And I always thought this would be cool as something to leave up in public maybe in a place where people can go and leave messages for each other. It's a really cool way of just providing like a, a method of interaction for each other. So it'll probably take a couple refreshes in order to get things working. But I imagine if I was to type a message. OK, so I'm going to type say hello, post. Hopefully that will eventually work and we'll see if we can get a message from someone else. And so far it hasn't crashed, so that's good. And you can see on this side, we've actually seen a message. You can even see what that message says. So if I were to refresh, it looks like it's taking a second to. But in our server here, we can see it say, hello world. And there we go. I just needed to refresh in the window. I can type, hello to you too. And we should be able to, uh, provided my scripts aren't blocking this, we should be able to communicate back and forth Although, as you can see, my, my Wi-Fi is trying desperately to connect to something that actually has internet. And there we go. So while this is a little bit slow in our test example, we had it working a lot faster before. Uh, and the ability to exchange a lot of text is really cool. So now you can see both of our messages are here. And you can see there's another message coming down the pipe. Haven't quite gotten it yet, but uh, insulting. <laughs> I didn't create an off-grid server to be insulted by my production crew. All right, so as you can see, Chatterbox is a way that we can be able to communicate with each other even when we don't have the infrastructure to technically get away with it. This has been a little bit of a rough example. And again, if you wanted to dress this up to make it look a little bit more official, I imagine you could do so and make this look quite nice. But for now, this is a pretty simple way of being able to send these messages, receive them, and just kind of communicate in a way that doesn't rely on anything other than a $5 microcontroller. The ESP32 chat server is a really interesting way of facilitating communication in an area that might not have things like cell towers. And it's also an interesting way for you to leave this in a public place and be able to facilitate chat between people who might not be all there at the same time. Now, if you like the functionality of this, you should check out our Pirate Box video and article on Nullbait because it is a similar vein of project with a lot more capability like file sharing and just in, in general, a lot more cool stuff. So if you like that, you can even do voice calls through it, as we found out last time. So this is kind of the little brother to that project, but still a really cool and interesting use of very cheap hardware. That's all we have for this episode of Cyber Weapons Lab. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you have any ideas for future episodes, make sure to send me a message on Twitter, because I'd love to hear from you. And if you got confused, again, check out the article on Nullbyte, because it'll be very helpful. All right, thank you guys. See you next time.